Little guy. It's not a bad little perch. And he was on the top one. Oh, quick release. And we threw him back. Quick release. But you know what, Brian? For a cold winter day on the Northeast River, down here in Northeast Maryland, we're down here yellow perch fishing right near the mouth of the Susquehanna Flats and the Chesapeake Bay. I think this is going to be a good one. I think I got a little guy on here. Bring him up. Yeah, that's another perch. We'll take him. That this guy was on the bottom rig. Yep. Now, Brian, where are we? We're in the Northeast River, uh, maybe a half mile from the very start of it, outside the Northeast Creek. And the Northeast River uh, feeds into the upper Chesapeake Bay, a couple miles south of the Susquehanna River that starts the Chesapeake Bay. Now, what's the nearest town? That should be an easy one. Northeast Maryland. Right. And there's a, a bunch of boat ramps here. We launched out of Anchor Marine. Yes. The Anchor Marine's a, the old standby. It's probably the best ramp on the river. Where I was going to launch out of originally was out of Charlestown, Maryland. But because of the wind and you fellas having camera equipment, I didn't want to see it get all wet. So I said that's why I would meet you at the Anchor Marine at the boat ramp there because it's more protected. And as you know, we did not have to, have to go very far to get to fishing water. Right, and that's the other thing. Like a lot of fishing, like you have secret spots, I have secret spots, but there's no secret here. There's a lot of boats out here. Yes, there are. And the fortunate thing is what there are, there's just a ton of perch around. So you get into an area like this area, it might be a, while, a mile wide and a mile long, and you just drift, drift through it, and you can catch fish almost anywhere. Right. And it's really a tremendous fishery for yellow perch. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been out here on good days where one or two of us, or two or three of us, have caught a couple hundred perch. Right. With 30 keepers, and the keepers have to be nine inches or bigger and we've caught a number of 12 13 inches and those are big fish for right. perch. now the, this is not huge water here we see all kinds of different boats out here we see small ones big ones bass boats center consoles this is really something just about anybody can do oh it is i've even seen kayak kayakers out here oh boy i think they're a little goofy but i've seen them out here right now this will go through the whole month of february right yes Yes, and into March. It's just a question of how long into March it will last. Mm -hmm. And just to just to give everybody a little tease as to what we're doing, we're drifting minnows. Yes, and not big minnows either, small ones. No, what are they? And maybe two inches. Hey, I got a bite. All right. No, I missed that one. Well, you got to you're, you're too worried about the camera. No, I want to catch a fish. Okay, I gotta yeah. catch me a fishy. Otherwise, you look too good. Well, thanks. <laughs> uh, my one word of advice to fishermen, if you come out here, you may think it's 50 to 60 degrees on land, but it's cold out here. And you get a breeze going across 37, 38 degree water, that's a heck of a refrigerator. And without the sun being up, it can be down outright cold out here. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. Today's forecast is 60 degrees. Right, in it's, February. It's not 60 out here. No, it isn't. You know, I, I thought I was going to catch up on my tan, bring my bathing suit, hang out, and you got to be dressed right for this stuff. Yeah, thank God you didn't bring your bathing suit, Steve. I'm, I'm happy it's a little too chilly for that. It's quite a sight. Yeah, I bet it is. You know what? Let's get back to some fishing. All right, that sounds like a game plan. You know what? I'm getting a little bike too. Let's okay, see if we, we might be into them. Here. Now that's a fat one. Yeah, that's a fat. That fish is. That's a male that hasn't spawned yet. Mm-hmm. He's a little fat guy. There we go. Double up. About time. Yeah, but look how big mine is compared to yours. 
Well, somebody's got to clean out the small fish, Steve. That's Thank it. you. Now, Brian, this fish is ice cold. What's the scoop here with the water temperature? It's 37, 38 degrees. And let me tell you this, if you were in that water swimming around in your bikini swim trucks, right. you'd be cold too, buddy. Right. Now let's talk a little bit about dressing for the cold because it's nice and warm on shore right now, okay? But we're in cold water and there's some extra safety steps you need to take. Yeah, and let me say this, this is probably the first day I've been out here fishing this winter where I haven't had a pair of black nylon pants on right. to keep it off my legs, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I've got a number of layers on. I've got a jersey on, a flannel shirt, a sweatshirt, and then a winter coat. And, and again, this is probably the lightest I've dressed out here all winter. Right. The other thing I'm wearing for you viewers, you lost your mic. Yes, yes is a uh, inflatable life vest. The nice thing about this, if by chance I go in, it will automatically inflate. Right. Uh, I'm not sure I'll survive the cold water, but at least my wife will have a body to bury. Well, you gave me the $20 to pull you out in case you fall in. Right. Now, right. I'm a little bit different. I don't have an inflatable. I've got my regular life jacket right here on the bottom of the boat, but also we've got a throwable. So if anybody fell in, you've got the throwable cushion to pitch right to them. Our throwable's not in a compartment. It's not under the anchor. It's right on the floor of the boat where it's accessible and that's really important. Oh, it is, absolutely. If you've got to try to find one of those things, dig under layers and get it stuck in a compartment, person could be not be able to get to it. By exactly, the throw it and it's on. safety first. It's safety first. But yes. fish are a close second. Yes, yes. Now, it, for example, if you went in the water with the fishing pole, right. quite frankly, I would grab the pole first and then you. It's a nice rod. It is. It is, it's a really nice rod. Yeah. But you know what's even more important? I lost my minnow and I need to get another minnow so you I do. can start fishing. Oh, there's a bite. Good fish, Steve. Yep. Now, while we're unhooking this fish, actually, I'm unhooking the fish. You're still fishing. Um, let's talk a little bit about how we're rigged up, what kind of tackle we're using. You know, obviously, spinning tackle, a nice little yellow perch. Yeah, uh, well, the rod line, the bulk of it is 15 pound uh, braided. And the reason right. I'm using this 15 pound braided is mm -hmm. earlier in the season, I was fishing 40, 50 foot deep. Right. And to be able to detect a, detect a bite from these little fish down that deep, you need the braid to increase the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And what I have then is about a three foot leader with a swivel on it. Right. This is 20 pound uh, fluorocarbon leader material. And notice how the hook sticks out from the line a little bit. Right. I don't know if you viewers can see that, but the purpose there is so that the perch don't run into the line when they're going after the bait. Right. And hooking these minis, you just gotta make them secure. Yep. And an interesting thing about these perch is they don't really care if the minnow is dead or alive. Right, so I just caught a fish, and what I'm just going to do is I'm going to hook my minnow on a little bit better so I don't lose it. Right. And go right back to fishing for them. There you go. Now, we're using quite a bit of weight here. We've probably got close to a half ounce here in well, the way you, of weight. You, you've got real close to an ounce. Right. Now, And that's because we're drifting. That's because it's blowing pretty good, yes. Right. Now, if we were anchored, we might get away with a little bit less weight. With a half ounce, you'd be fine. But the way to actually find a fish is to drift and cover a lot of water. Right. And we're sort of banging fish everywhere we go. Sure. So it's not a problem. Right. But what the, do you say we get back to fishing and so I can turn this boat around so the line doesn't drift under the boat? Well, if you really want to catch some more fish, I got no problem with okay, that. Okay, that's what we'll do then. All right. Yeah. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let him eat it. Yep, I got him. Oh yeah. Nice good fish. Oh yeah, absolutely. We'll take them all. You know what's really neat? You can see the orange on the fins on the bottom of this fish. Let me get them unhooked. Aren't they beautiful? Yep. Look at the oranges. They got the sides with the dark sides on them with the, the bars on it. Now this is a little different for me compared to where I fish, Brian. 
What, what's on the bottom here? Let's get this fish back. This is basically a, uh, I'm going to call it a muck bottom. Right. Very little cover or rocks or anything right in here. It's a, I'd say a 10, 12 foot flat. Right. And my suspicion is the fish just come up here to spawn. Okay. For whatever reasons, this is what they want. Right. Now, is there is there a channel that runs through this area? Are we fishing structure at all? Is it pretty no, much flat? No, this is just flat. It's a, a flat uh, area. Over to our left, there is a channel where it's a little bit deeper. Uh, right. That would probably be a migratory route. Hey, you don't mind if I catch another one, no, do you? No, please do. You know what? I can think of a lot worse things we could be doing in February than this. You're right. It is another one. Another Again, nice now, fish. this one's fins are even more orange than the last one. You can really see, look at that orange Beautiful. there. What a nice fish. And the nice thing is we're lip hooking these fish and I'm gonna get them right back in the water. And you know what? I need another minnow. Well, you help yourself. They're there to you. got plenty of them. Nice guy. What a nice guy. Yeah. You know, you have to pay attention to catch these guys because the bite is not real Good. Oh, that poor guy hit. That's I'm okay. We're we're padded on the bottom. I'm gonna put him back in because right. he took a little bounce. Right. He swam away to be caught another day. Right. Now something that we haven't talked about yet is there's other anglers out here, and a lot of them are out here to actually catch these fish to eat. They're delicious. So I'm told. I don't eat fish. <laughs> I do, and I've had perch many times, and they're very good. Now there there are some limits and restrictions. This just isn't catch as many as you want, take as many as you want. Correct. Uh, what the Maryland DNR or the rules are, each licensed fisherman is allowed to catch nine or ten keepers. They must be nine inch each. Right. And I have a dink board down there that and, if and we were... And that's just a board where you're going to put the nose up against one end, the tail has to break the line at nine inches to make it legal. Correct. And that's a lot easier than using a rule or or, or a cooler that's marked? Yes, if anybody comes out here with the intent of keeping fish, they, they'd be wise to spend the money and buy a dink board of some type. Right, now to, to go out and, and catch, you know, 10 fish per person, if it was two of us to catch 20 keepers, how doable is that? Is that is that impossible or is that something that most people can do? Oh, by no means, it's not impossible. Uh, every, certainly every day is a different day, but I've had days out here where we fished four or five hours and caught a couple hundred fish right. and with 30 keepers. Mm -hmm. That's with three people. Right. Now, most of the fish we catch are, are probably somewhere around six or seven inches, so they're not that, uh, that far. I think you got one. I think I do, there too. There you go. And that looks like a pretty nice one. It might be. Look at that one. That's a fat one. Yes, it is. Now, that might be a... That is probably a keeper. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's a really nice fish. Now, when I get this guy off of here, if you let me through, Steve, yep. I'll show you my dink board and how you measure them. Right. You think that'd be a good thing to do? Yeah, I, I think that'd be pretty interesting for people to see how it works. Let me grab your rod. Please do. Yep. Now, here's a, this is a homemade dink board. If you can see, I've got the big nine. That's the minimum size. So I'm gonna put him down on here, put his nose up against the end of the board, and his tail extends out to about 10 inches. So that's certainly a nice keeper. And this guy is pretty fat. This fish has not spawned yet. It's getting close, but it hasn't spawned yet. And that, Steve, you're probably licking your chops, but I'm going to let this guy go to spawn and catch again another day. Yep, let's catch a few more. Really neat fish. Let me just lift them up. Oh yeah, that's another nice one. 
Interesting, you caught that one on the top one. Yep, and that one was on the top hook. And what we'll do is we're going to take a, a little look at this guy, and then we're going to talk a little bit about these guys. Isn't that a nice fish? Beautiful. Okay. What we're going to do is I'm going to let this guy go back, this guy go back, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what these fish are and what they're doing. So we'll just get them back nice and easy. Okay. Now, these yellow perch, Brian, they spawn at a temperature of about 50 degrees. Okay, and, and they're up here and they're wintering in these areas. And the neat thing is, and I really didn't notice until I did a little bit of looking, is these fish, they actually mature at age two or three and they start spawning. What happens is the yellow perch spawn and it'll be three or four males will be with one female. And the female will leave her eggs on a string on the bottom or on a dock piling. And what'll happen is three or four males will fertilize that and they can lay between 2,000 and 3,000 eggs. Now here's something I also didn't know, that you've seen a lot of cormorants here, right? Yes. Well, yellow perch make up a big part of a cormorant's diet. And what you can tell is the healthiness of the fishery by how many yellow perch are still around because they eat the yellow perch instead of largemouth bass. And that's, I had no idea. I didn't until either. Until I looked it up. So that's a good tip for you. If you're in an environment where there's not a lot of panfish and you see cormorants, then the habitat isn't as good and the fish population isn't as good. About this rig for a second because here's something interesting right sometimes we're catching them on this bottom hook okay and sometimes we're catching them on top hook let me throw this guy back so we can talk about this rig for sure. a second let me straighten the boat out yep. here and it is really windy out here now let's talk about this rig here we got the fish back now we have two hooks here a high hook and a low hook that fish was on a low hook why are we using two hooks and, and why do we just not use one? Good question, Steve. Every day you don't know if the fish are going to be closer to the bottom or perhaps more aggressive and be hitting the hook that's up maybe 18 inches. Uh, it doesn't cost any more to throw two hooks, so you might as well cover both bases. Right, and the other thing I notice is we can play around with the size of the minnows that we're using. If we think we're getting light bites, we can go to smaller minnows and find out if the fish we're catching are smaller. Correct. And maybe if the fish are bigger, we can go to a bigger minnow and not catch so many of the smaller fish. Correct. You know, I think that's a great tip for people that are fishing out here. Use the high-low rig and use different size minnows to experiment and you can catch more fish. Yes, and or if you're using artificial, sometimes you want to use smaller or bigger uh, artificial little uh, twisty tails or something. Okay, and you could do that, and that's another good tip. You know what, I think we're ready to get back to fishing. Th that would be great. All right. Well, Brian, we're done fishing for the day. It got a little breezy out there. Just a little bit. Boat control became an issue, but we're ready for the tackle box section of the show. Now I'm gonna start it off 
with something that can really be a help. It's something we didn't use today because we're covering a lot of water, but anchors can be a very part, important part of what you bring with you, not only for safety, but positioning the boat to catch fish. Now we've got two types of anchors you got here. We've got the larger Danforth anchor, which is this guy here, and then we've got a mushroom anchor. Now, when would you use each one of these anchors? Well, in a real stiff breeze like we had today, I would definitely use the Stan Danford if I wanted to stay in one location. Uh, once that anchor is out, you're not going anywhere backward or forwards, but the tail end of the boat, depending on the w wind, may move considerably. Then you could put this mushroom anchor out on the stern and it will help keep you stationary. In a light breeze, you can get away with that anchor of right. holding you stationary. Right, now something else you can do with this mushroom anchor is in a breeze that's maybe a little more than light, you can actually use this to slow the drift of your yes. boat. You could put it out and that'll slow you down a little bit. Yes. But the important thing we had today, and for me the big important thing, was the rig. Okay, I like I, that. I, I like the rig. It's very similar to some of the stuff we do in saltwater fishing and some other stuff, and it's a high-low rig. Now, we've got two hooks here, a high one and a low one. The first thing I want to show you is how we actually rig the minnow, because we're going to take the hook, and I can just grab a minnow out of here. These are nice, lively minnows. They're jumping all over the place. Here we go. And I'm going to take, and I'm going to hook the minnow through the bottom lip and out the top lip. And as you can see, the minnow remains lively. It goes through the water swimming forward as it usually would. And you're not dragging it sideways or backwards. Their minnows are lively. They're flopping all over the place. <laughs> Very lively. And you know what? Let's get these back in the water since there's kind of they're a water breathing deal. Now, another thing is we've got a high hook and a low hook. Okay? We talked about putting different size minnows on the hook because the fish might be finicky or we might have a preference on a day. My preference is to use two different size minnows, to use a small one on one hook and a large one on another. And here's the other kicker. What we could do is we could swap out. If I'm using a small minnow on a low hook, you use the small minnow on a high hook. That way we're, we're really figuring out what the fish want. Now, the other key to this is the sinker. Okay, we used a sinker that's about a half ounce today. Yes. Sometimes yes. we added some split shot if it was in between sizes, but you can also go up to a much larger sinker. Right. And that can change because of water depth, drift, and things like that. Now, there's also some other stuff we can do. We have the option of maybe not using live bait at all, and using one of these plastic grubs, like this little two-inch kaolin grub. Got a little chartreuse tail here, a little kind of root beer and chartreuse on it. The other thing is, we can put the grub on there, and we can still put the minnow on there. Absolutely. Now, do you find days that, that you do that a lot? Yes. Uh, last week, I was out with a couple fellows in the morning. We were catching them all on minis, and we never changed because we were, we were just catching so many fish. Right. At the end of the day, we started running out of minis, and we started with five dozen. Mm -hmm. uh, we started throwing grubs, and that particular day, they were just eating any and everything. Right. Not, not that the minis are that expensive. I think they're $2 a dozen. Mm -hmm. But if they're eating anything, why not throw rubber? Right. Now we got another thing we can do. We can take, and we can use this little tube. Now this little tube's got a lot of color to it. It's like a little, what, inch and a half, two inch tube? I'd say inch and a half, right. yes. Now this is a pretty wild color. Why don't you tell me just a little bit about this color? Well, the, the reason I like it, there's been days where they want red, and there's days when they like chartreuse best. Well, that has a, both of them, so I figure it's a no fail type of tube because it has both colors. And if they're key, keying on color, that will certainly grab their attention. Right. And while we're talking about colors, what colors do you like to use down here? Well, I like the chartreuse in the red. Uh, several weeks ago, I was out fishing and I happened to have some pink 
Senkos, mm -hmm. and I was cutting off little inch and a half pieces, and I don't know why, but that day they were eating that color really aggressively. Wow. Uh, I've also used some, uh, you can see them in the tackle box, some bright red worms right. that I'll cut off an inch and a half, two mm -hmm. inch piece of red worm, right. and it can work. And, and today we threw mostly uh, minnows. We didn't have a chance to do a lot of experimenting because it was pretty windy out there. But when it's nice and calm, you can do some serious right. experimenting. Right, now one more thing before we wrap up the tackle box. I've got an important tool here. This is Brian's dink board. Now, we call it a dink board because of bass tournaments that we both used to fish. Right. But this board, if you put the perch's nose here and the tail here, you can see it's marked for nine inches. That's a legal perch. And it's very important because if you get stopped and your perch is too short, you've got problems. Very serious problems. Exactly. The, the man was over in the Susquehanna River several weeks ago, and I think his pen ran out of ink because he was writing so many people up for short fish and no licenses. So it's very important to follow the rules, only keep what you can eat, and make sure you don't keep more than a limit. That's right, Steve. It, it, you know, all fish, it's too precious of a natural resource to have the fish wasted. And if you're not going to truly eat them, put them back alive so that you can catch them and their offspring again some other day. Right. Hey, for Delaware Valley Outdoors, I'm Steve Horvath, and that's your Tackle Box. Oh yeah, bring him up here. That's a nice fish. They're all nice, Steve. Yep. Some are just a little nicer than others. Right. And, and you know, these fish, they're easy to unhook most of the time. Yeah. And I put them back alive. Well, Brian, the wind is coming up. We caught a good share of fish. And I think this is a good time to thank you for coming out with us. Again, Brian from Brian's Guide Service, Brian Imicus. Hey, you can check us out, DelawareValleyOutdoors.com. Check us out on Facebook at Delaware Valley Outdoors. Hey, I think we had a good day. And Excellent you know what? Day. For February, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Thanks, dude. That's it. Let's get in where it's nice and warm. We got off. Sorry. There's a starter. Here we go. He got first. off. He got off. Oh. No. Might have just been bottom. No. Nope. I let him have it. Yep. You dropping it or? Yep. It's just a peck and drop. Which is, to me is, is Fisher having a hard time eating. Little guy. It's not a bad little perch. And he was on the top one. On the oh, quick release. We threw him back. Let him swim. He's off. He's off.